everybody. Tim Hughes, um, CEO and co-founder from DLA Night. Um, welcome back, Ed. Uh, welcome back indeed. Back after summer break. Back yeah. talking about technology and AI again. Not Absolutely, sure. yeah. On the beach. <laughs> did, did you did you go to the metaverse or did you did you go anywhere? Oh yeah, obviously. I take my uh, my vacations in the metaverse. Mm. Uh, last covered by virtual midges. You, you, you sit at home, yes, yeah, with virtual midges, yes, and virtual mosquitoes. Exactly. No, I went to that. Um, so we've got some interesting ones to catch up, and there's a lot happened over the summer and now, but we're going to start off gently with two uh, conversations, one about um, training, essentially, and some mm. new areas, and one about creativity. But we'll start with the training one, and it's it's from news that says, comes through that the German Defence Institute have uh, released uh, the first fruits of their $500 million investment in metaverse and training, which they started basically at the back end of COVID. This was um, a line item hidden in the bottom of their COVID recovery bill, that they were going to throw half a billion dollars into high-tech defense and training. And they've got a bunch of universities to go with the uh, Bundeswehr um, military academies. And they've come up with this concept of basically embedding AI into effectively virtual training programs. So this, so this isn't about training um soldiers in ai yeah. no no it's not about training soldiers in ai it's using ai to train soldiers in the business of being soldiers right and the idea being is that in in sort of wave one you will have a more realistic world there will be things that happen so in wave one this is pretty simple stuff you can get things like tanks and aircraft and helicopters to behave more naturally and to react to what you're doing and wave two it is designed to, to basically put through a bit more strategic stuff and what they've done is they're trying to build uh, essentially like a feedback loop between the training and the outcomes of the training and actually the programming of some real weaponry is right. the direction of travel. So if you can imagine that you've got uh, a metaverse type experience, and it, in my opinion, uh, the, the sort of defense field is the only successful usage of metaverse because you're trying to synthesize and present lots of information. And, and they must have had metaverse type um, well, if you think about it like a, a, a flight simulator, to a degree, yes. the metaverse type thing, particularly when they're linked to network together, it, it becomes very rapidly a shared virtual environment mm -hmm. uh, with with visual repetition away from, shall we say, uh, just numbers. In, in the defense one, they stick you inside a tank or they stick you inside a helmet and they stick you inside an aircraft or they've got submarine simulators, etc., that are designed to show sort of the controls and the realistic battle space around it. Now, this is used for both training and to a degree, very high fidelity ones are used for sort of battle planning, battle strategy as well. Now, this is an obvious field for AI investment. So in the past, there's been investments uh, of things of just how you make things behave. There was early investments of uh, how airplanes would behave and react to things around them. This is now taken a lot further because they've involved a, there's a degree of um, population of, of virtual colleagues or comrades as well. So okay. one of the primary expensive parts of this was you had to get lots of people together to train them to give you a realistic, this is my squad type of script. That made it more difficult to train sometimes. So they're trying to now basically create virtual teammates. Second one is obviously virtual enemies, virtual non-combatants as well. And what they're trying to do is make them not just play out little modeled lives like you get in, say, a computer game, but actually to react to you and to your actions in realistic ways. Now, this has got some fascinating um, sort of uh, 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 consequences and implications of it. Number one is obviously, what are you training these things on? Mm. And how are you actually managing? So there's fascinating stuff around bias in this one, and not just in a sort of representative layer, but actually, where did you train the, the behavior of enemy competence on, or your own competence? Yeah. Um, if it's enemy competence, is this purely from a Western point of view? What would be different philosophies of war? And war is a pretty Darwinian test of philosophies at its, at its sort of most ethereal level. And that means where are you getting test data to make this accurate? Are you just getting some people up to a level of, of standard? Or are you trying to do something a bit more complex? The second one is actually this potential feedback loop. And they, they mentioned in the article that, that, that I read that, that they're trying to effectively take data out of these simulations and put it into battlefield tech. And the other thing is that once you've tested out a series of scenarios with an AI acting as, say, a drone swarm or helicopters, you can now program up, say, in the German case, they were talking about their Gepard anti-aircraft tank, uh, anti tank. 
that you can do it to prioritize and attack drone swarms in different orders. Now, this sounds kind of slightly abstract, but it's quite interesting because obviously the war in Ukraine has changed the way that people see warfare and it's yeah. to do a pretty rapid evolution as war always does. Mm. Second thing is it's, uh, it, it's exposed some interesting economic changes to the world. If you're attacking an enemy with $500 cardboard drums with a couple of sticks of dynamite in it and some off-the-shelf kit, and they're the only thing they've got to shoot it down with is a $2 million missile, how many of these $500 drones have you just got to send over before you start having serious economic impacts on this? And not just in the terms of, shall we say, the overall long game economics, but actually how do you use these things potentially as decoys to degrade higher value anti-aircraft systems. So one of the things they're saying is we're going to simulate this by the tens of thousands through these AI models and use this to correct and improve the uh, algorithms and AI that sits inside weapon systems that are cheap. So, for example, a Gepard doesn't use missiles. It uses $100 bullets. And those are a lot cheaper than $2 million top-of-the-range missiles. So you can effectively bring back a layered capability. And this is all coming about through this intersection between metaverse which is kind of now seen as a, a slightly over egged technology yep. simulation which is a core part of what we do as a living in technology and ai which brings in this thing of sort of contextualization and we're not talking about generative ai type stuff we're talking about ai in a more true sense where this doesn't require a human being checking every stage of the work it understands what it's doing it's got its own self-contextualization and to a degree self-supervision so you can let this thing conduct millions, potentially billions of scenarios and actually start to develop some really interesting scenarios out of it. But all of this really clever work does depend on one thing, that the data you're training the initial scenarios on is robust and free from bias and will act in a reasonable way. Now, this gives a really the third part of the feedback loop, and it's going to be very interesting, is you're now seeing a third leg of data feed coming out of it. One of the things that's come out is there is a game called War Thunder. And War Thunder is famous for A, being have some really adherent uh, fans who get pretty rabid about it. B, for being almost predictably a place where highly classified information gets leaked onto its boards all the time. But thirdly, they're now proposing to take the feeds out of these virtual battles that people play for games and use them to recorrect the battlefield simulators that will then refeed real battlefield behavior. It's, it's a fascinating dynamic because obviously the bit that the AI can't do is replicate human innovation. I mean, these AIs have the same flaw as generative AIs do, etc. They tend to be a bit beige. You get a very predictable series of behaviors because you can't program for extremists and bad moods and the, the richness of the human imagination. So they're now taking these feeds out from the back of these computer games. Now, I'm not sure if War Thunder has actually activated it. It's been talking about a lot that essentially War Thunder and other games, and I use War Thunder because it's the one that was mentioned in one of the comments I saw, these become the true up for this type of scenario. And therefore the game becomes more real in some respects than this. So you can kind of see, and it sort of boils on that the latest generations of some of the weapons have no human beings in at all, that the game players are fighting a very real war in a sort of philosophical sense because the stuff in the battlefield is just robots blowing each other up well i mean we we all know that um you know if you have a if you have a war then people find money to um innovate um, to, yeah and innovate um and so you could see the situation where um the bigger country um could um and their armed forces could actually start getting into the games business and this is actually quite true i mean this gives actually where britain does slightly punch above its weight given its uh, a uh, huge emphasis on gaming in the United Kingdom. But it, it's a really fascinating area that that sort of game design model is structurally remarkably akin to battlefield architecture and battlefield planning. And this idea is of a commonality of skills in the sort of coming generations. These skills become very rapidly translatable. Obviously, there's some people around, shall we say, are you aware of, um, are you aware of the security implications of this? Because people who play War Thunder particularly don't seem to be. But anyway, that was the sort of first, first fascinating one. And thank you, Paul. That's an interesting looking article you've just surfaced up there. Um, and I'll, I'll... What, what, what is the? Can you can you see what the article is? I can't actually click on it. No, I can't actually. I think let me just try if I can get it there. Ah, 
Spy text, of course, serious risk if we lose the edge. Yes, I saw that, Paul, actually. Fascinating. There, there was an article also recently um, about um, the, the when the, if a war arrives, then basically part of the war, and it's kind of, I'm going off a bit of a tangent, then part of the war will be misinformation on the internet. Absolutely. And 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 stuff, which is then part of the confusion. And well, I think that's very much so, and particularly on the sort of you've got strategic level disinformation, tactical level disinformation, and almost real time disinformation as you to hide things. But, but thanks, Paul, for sharing that. By the way, and it's an interesting article, and it's completely correct. And the technology edge is going to be ever more apparent in this one. But that was just enough for that one. I think we'll return back to that sort of that particular feedback loop will be a common theme in, in future articles. That's how you effectively find sources of data to true up the AI generated experience to keep it relevant, which is a pretty weak segue into our second comment, which is uh, the rise of consumer tools that can create entire creative experiences. Uh, I'm using it sort of deliberately, uh, sort of create and created. So the, the article I shared was uh, a comment of people just going, wow, this is effectively a free service that can create a song. That sounds like pretty much 30% of all top 100 hits. And that's a a concept that betrays me. It's funny because in the um, in the article, um, which is on Reddit, I forgot to put them in the under my um, uh, in the um, um, on LinkedIn, but I will do that. Um, it's funny because at the end of the article, it says, um, "Well, d does does this music? We agree this music sounds like anything in the charts right now." But then that's the point. It is, and this is because it's trained on the charts. So this is that, but the, the, the differential step with this one and the sort of innovation why we're talking about it, this is not just an AI creating some lyrics. It's also creating the vocals and the moves, uh, the music, and the um, background video as well, in effectively a series of clicks. Now, the example we've shared, and we will share the links uh, later on, mm. it, it is, still has some flaws because the it does, it does. Grids go, will only create in 30-second chunks. Is why yeah, you can see the, the it's, like, it's like there's a, if i can talk old-fashioned it's like there's a tape and they've cut the tape and it's literally it's, it's edited like that but i think what it betrays the fact is that this is going to come very much more rapidly than we thought i remember talking last year that this ai supported creativity again with a beige problem and the sort of middle of the road mush could sort of create some useful there so the prompt i said is is this something new that could be created, something, so for example, a, a deeply personalized uh, experience. So for example, we've all read science fiction where the uh, protagonist, uh, effectively background track is targeted to their art rate or adrenaline levels, et cetera, to focus on that. And we've all sort of read about runners uh, when they're practicing using very targeted and focused playlists to ensure their best performance of a certain targeted runs. Well, obviously, you can imagine AI just taking known material and generating that not quite creative, but sort of augmented sensorium type stuff for easily. And secondly, the, the, the sort of problem occurs is, does this give us sort of something new and innovative like uh, music for airports was originally by Brian Eno? Or is, this, or is this just, which was effectively storytelling without words, uh, or is this just elevator music in its cruelest sense? And there was a debate uh, on LinkedIn earlier that was talking about um, effectively, well, you could use this technology for certain areas. So, for example, mood music in a restaurant. Ideally, you don't notice music in a restaurant. If you're noticing the music in a restaurant, something is very badly wrong with either the restaurant or the music. But you could adapt using technology to this and a simple microphone attached to uh, the, the sort of room that the restaurant is in. You could change the background music or develop new background music purely according to what sounds are coming. You could easily feed that in. And in that use case, it being sort of bland, middle-of-the-road stuff doesn't really matter. I suspect if you're driving along the motorway and not really particularly listening to what's uh, coming up on the radio, an experience like this of it just giving you background music based on your car's feed could be quite interesting. But what we're already seeing is now is there's quite a draconian reaction to some of the publishing things. So you've already seen Spotify and Amazon both putting in both effectively AI tests and also a legal assertion from the artist that how much, uh, effectively a disclosure, how much AI support was given to this tune. Now that's could be used relatively draconianly because their definition of AI can be remarkably broad. In some respects, even using stuff like auto-tune could be regarded as a form of AI. If, yeah. you, if you regard it that way, and obviously auto-tune has been a blight on, on modern popular music for quite some time. It's, it's enabled a lot of um, people to carry on uh, singing in tune for 
well past their, their yeah. due date. And it's made an awful lot of people a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But it gives you certain uh, sort of new areas that we're talking about. Um, there was a discussion from some of the clubs in Ibiza about using AI to chop out some of their pretty more expensive um, run-of-the-mill DJs, saving more money for the sort of headline DJs, which is, again, a change to the music uh, sort of industry because there's fairly big business in, in clubs and an awful lot of EDM could already be generated by AI straight away, frankly, I think. Um, but the... The particular one that we saw today on LinkedIn, uh, 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 on the on the Reddit article, I should say, brought up because the number of comments on this article were saying that this doesn't just sound like anything. This sounds quite good. This sounds pretty middle of the road, obviously. It, it's uh, it's like anything that you'd probably hear on Capital Radio here, in, yeah. which is like you know probably the most up to the minute. Popular, popular radio station. Based on my ears, that that, that, that yeah. is, yeah. And I think, actually, I mean, I played it through and I took some analysis of my own Spotify library in some areas, did a background sort of analysis of how close this tune was to certain classifications of music. And you can see where it's it's painfully a statistical match. But it's an interesting one is because music and this one creatively have the, also the ability to inform, not just effectively entertain. Is there anything that's going to become around new musical flattening, shall we say? Obviously, in previous generations, we've always seen a new musical or a new creative, effectively, revolution as a response to a previous generation's or decades flatlining. Well, well, was, was not Stock Aiken and Waterman a, a change, okay. basically creating a... I mean, there's always been musical factories. Yeah. And this is now an automated one you can carry around with you. But yeah. I think the interesting thing is that, again, this is, in this particular use case, it's very backwards looking. There's no risk of innovation coming out of one of these things. At best, it could synthesize styles together. You could have, I don't know, techno bluegrass or sort of ambient skiffle, to quote a joke from the past. But these, these backward-looking stuff, it really kind of breaks into areas. One, that real innovation in things like music comes from effectively journeymen. It comes from people who have got small uh, openings and get small recordings and stuff like that. Those people are strongly imperiled by this. Secondly, because it's going to effectively degrade broadcast music to a degree you're kind of going to have to listen to if i'm hearing anything is this by a person or is this by an ai and if it is by a person it's more of a conscious choice now instead yeah of i mean i i would say that i mean i know a number of people that would have that grew up listening to 70s music hmm. who saw the 80s and the synthesizer as a as basically automated music yeah well i think it was, it was Jim Morrison actually said this was a form of musical automation. Yeah, 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 and and so uh, and and so you know, and then again in the nineties because you know dance music is you know a friend of mine calls dance music car alarm music because he says it sounds like a car alarm going off. Well, oh, to a degree, that highly repetitive sort of spike. Yeah, so so AI is a, and then we've talked before about is AI just the brush. And what we do as humans is that we're providing the creativity, and and what we do is that we you know we take brush and we take paint, and then we and that's and that's part of the art. It could be, and again that plays back to if you're using this as a brush, then prompt engineering, which is, is a poor word, gets more important. But I think in terms of there, there's two ways to look at this. One, there's a, almost a democratization of creativity. You can get half decent results now, pretty much by yourself. But that means to make a living out of music becomes harder. It will be either you get a sort of a, a more reliance on large scale brands. And you've seen some of the IP control of some of the larger bands from the 60s, 70s and 80s rigidly controlling their IP. They're already sending cease and desist notes to the AI companies. You're using my beat pads, etc. which is interesting because another person has already um, effectively trademarked or copyrighted, I can't remember the phrase, every single conceivable musical sequence and put it onto an open use license. It's almost now impossible to say that this is stolen music. And there's been a number of, there was a court case recently, wasn't there, from yeah. um, the, f the family of... Um, um, yes, I remember. It, they took Ed Sheeran to court. Yeah, it did. And they, they lost in the end because it was a generic thing. But the second thing is it means it's going to be very much harder to establish any form of living in this space because a lot of the low-level use cases have now just been read. It's, there's always been, a, shall we say, a common factor that the ability to be a scaled brand in some creative areas, you get the sort of 
billboard level um, uh, uh, authors. You get the sort of blockbuster leading men and women. You get uh, the sort of famous bands. There's almost going to be a reliance more and more and more of those because nobody's going to pay for the expense of innovation anymore. Whereas music may itself become more personalized, democratized. The human element is going to be changed. And there's going to be a fascinating dynamic as that shakes out because obviously the truest sense of value in this is following the money. Now, if I can pay zero dollars and get effectively any tune that I want out of um, an engine, why am I even going to be paying the 15 or so quid a month I have for Spotify? Which is, to be honest, mostly bland beige as well. Because you just go, yeah, I don't like it. Click, click, click. I, I mean, there's a possibility that you could get, I'm assuming that you could get the AI say, right, I want you to write music in the um, style of Genesis. Yeah, but Genesis, but also, but with a different, with original um, Peter Gabriel vocals through all tunes. That could be done with that relatively limited stuff. But again, those those larger bands are going to have the money to defend their IP, almost yeah. to defend their character. Whereas what you're going to be is it's sort of new and innovative bands that take longer to be found and sourced, their livelihoods are going to be more under threat. So effectively, there's there's almost like an existential risk to the quality of music going forward by this stuff. stuff. And I'm not normally a doomsayer. I think this is a, a form of uh, democratization. But I think that shakeout in value do we actually have a medium that looks forward and creates new stuff? Or is this going to be the commercial money mostly falls into effectively replaying PAP? I mean, I mean, maybe, I mean, there's the two people that I think of, which is Stephen Wilson and Bruce Sword. Yeah. So that's um, the um, um, Pineapple Thief. And um, what, basically they started off in their bedrooms yeah. and, then, and, then, and then they became bands. And now if they've got a better tool, you could have basically a single person by themselves doing the vocals and the AI creates the rest of it. Yeah. But how is that going to be monetized in the way forward? How is anybody going to be able to stick with this? Now, obviously, people are going to say, well, careers always change and stuff. But this is a relatively large industry that's now facing some pretty deep thoughts over the thought. And this example we were going to show on the, on the, 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 the linked article is literally just the tip of the iceberg. Because this stuff is somebody that created a pretty much middle of the road but successful, good sounding song in four minutes and for nothing. And that's that's a big change. Ed, thank you so much for coming on and researching the articles and, and, and talking about them. It, I, I find this fascinating. I hope the audience do as, as well. Uh, I've actually missed it over the summer. Well, I, th I think it's an interesting area to talk, and the, the pace of innovation is only going up. It, it, it is, and um, um, I mean, there's a there's a lot of articles which are the same old, same old. Um, but um, I mean, this. Th thank you for finding these articles, which are you know where we can have a really good debate and chat uh, about it. I think next week we'll probably in next session we'll probably talk about gaming again. Okay. The area of uh, immediate innovation where people can experience the results of themselves straight away. And I, and I so I've read three books about the metaverse over the last um, three months. Um, and um, th thanks, Paul. Um, um, and all of them see gaming as basically the foundation. It is. Um, and, um, and, and so I'm, I'm not a gamer. Um, but so if there's non-gamers watching, don't necessarily turn off because you're not a gamer. It gaming is a foundation for this. It's a foundation for the metaverse. It's an immersive experience. It is. I mean, we're going to talk about AI in sort of various areas. One is about the creation of games, which we've touched on before. Secondly, some of the media use cases in gameplay. But also thirdly, we're going to talk about the economics of this. And we're going to have yeah. a slightly deeper dive into how the money flows, which I think a lot of people find value. Yeah. But anyway, thank you very much, Tim. See you Thanks, Thanks Ed. Thank you so Thanks much. Paul. Thanks, Thanks for your Thanks, Paul.